looking organized when you say it. <laughs> um, I think I'm mic'd, so probably don't need that. <clears throat> so is that sounds okay even in the back? We're good. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for um, for the bids team for both organizing the series and letting me speak in it. And I am hoping that what this talk does is raise more questions than answer. And so what I'm going to try to do is to give the broader, so I hate to disappoint the power engineers in the room and the people who spend most of their time doing, auto, doing uh, data scraping. I'm going to try to illustrate some of the ways that we use these things. But I want to invite anyone interested to come to my much smaller laboratory meeting. So the Rail Lab meets for lunch every Wednesday. Tomorrow's session is actually by one of the, le the national level leads in India on data science and energy efficiency. And it's a kind of interesting example of the kind of things that we try to drill down on more. So anything which I don't do enough detail here, I'm hoping you'll see fairly quickly where the, the material is and you'll be able to find us. And so what I'm going to try to cover is just introduce my lab for a little bit because this is an audience that I don't normally um, interact with. And then I'll do very quickly on the, um, what is the, the current state of not theory but action, which means it can be a short section, on decarbonizing uh, the energy systems. If it was on theory, I could spend the whole, whole uh, hour, but action, two slides. Um, and then I want to look at this, as Valerie mentioned, these large scale power systems and what are the real challenges in terms of converting them from where they are today to clean energy systems. Um, and then I'm going to try to focus um, much of the talk on the second half, which is area where we have some very nice data tools but we have not thought hard about the ways to make it most user friendly. And so I'm keen for any feedback, but I'm in particular hoping to kind of make this last piece the conversation. Um, and so again, I'll start off with, with laboratory rail. Um, I think this is actually, la yeah, this is last fall's um, lab meeting picture. As I said, we meet on Wednesdays at noon in Barrows Hall and anyone is welcome. Um, and it's a quite eclectic group. There are people who are thinking about essentially classic problems in electrical engineering and power systems. Others who are thinking very much about behavioral issues. Um, people come from a variety of departments with, uh, with ERG and the Goldman School as the most represented. But there are people from economics and from rhetoric, um, all kinds of places. And so we'll kind of get into that in a little bit. Um, Rail's been around for a while, so we have lots of graduates in interesting places. Um, from President Obama's final um, as, uh, senior advisor for, um, for, for climate change, um, to people who got their, their degrees in, 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 in energy and resources but are now professors of economics. Um, Deborah Sunter was uh, one of your fellows this, this last year's cycle. I think she holds the record, at least as far as I know. At one point, she had 24 undergraduates technically working through rail, which meant I signed all the forms, but Deborah did most of the work. Um, to people like Majid Azati, who runs the National Health Outcomes Assessment um, for the UK government. Um, Carl Peterman, one of our energy commissioners, who did our PhD on solar. So it's a pretty interesting and diverse group of PhD students. Um, and at the master's level, there's people like Cyrus Wadia, who used to be in the Obama administration, is now head of sustainability for Nike. It's a very interesting group. Dimitri Gershenson um, runs energy access at Facebook. So there are some really interesting places where kind of the Silicon Valley data culture um, and sustainability come together. Sam Ahrens was head of sustainability for Google, and now he's uh, lifted himself to lift. Um, and we have a fair range of undergraduates, and um, neither the Goldman School nor ERG have an undergraduate major. We both have undergraduate minors, and so many of those um, students I mentioned came through those um, two, pro two programs um, as undergraduates, uh, but not as majors in ERG. Um, the website of the lab is here. Uh, we try to tweet about once a day um, about things in the lab. This is not my vacation tweets, um, although I've been accused of that, but it's definitely not supposed to be. And 
we founded Rail in 1999 when I came to Berkeley and um, was, I was working initially on large scale energy systems and projects and so did a lot of work with and for the IPCC which meant that got this wonderful plaque in the mail in 2007. I think it was four of us on campus, uh, Inez Fung, Bill Collins, uh, Turk Smith and I, um, I might have, I don't think I missed anybody, but maybe, who got this kind of Nobel Prize plaque, which sounds great. Um, we've had a lot of graduates. Um, and we have some pretty interesting partnerships that we'll, I'll allude to in the talk. Um, we work with three major Chinese universities, University of Tokyo, Government of Morocco, some local companies. And even though the Nobel Prize was in 2007 in Berkeley's kind of slower path, we didn't do the Saul Nobel route where you get the NL parking space, which of course is the critical feature on campus. But after a great deal of internal debate on campus as to what they would do for these four people who did not receive a Nobel Prize, but contributed to the IPCC, the campus's decision was, I think, appropriate. Um, and we get to share a Nobel laureate bike rack. But if you read the fine print, it says parking not reserved for IPCC contributors, all cyclists welcome. It is in front of the Free Speech Movement Cafe, but I, I have to say this is uh, just about as Berkeley as it can get. And I think that's a uh, wonderful and appropriate kind of a uh, piece of the story. So last bit of introduction to the lab is that um, I was sort of lucky in the sense I came here in 99 and relevant to the story I'll talk about today, um, in 1996, California passed what proved to be essentially a disastrous bill to deregulate the utility industry, um, which led for people older than age 20 to a rememberable and to others not rememberable series of blackouts. Um, and if I had been a faculty here at the time, I probably would have said a whole range of stupid things. Um, like almost everybody else, but because I was in New Jersey at the time, I was spared my own foolishness. Um, and so got to play an interesting role very quickly in thinking about how California could essentially step back from a very poor decision to basically open up our electricity markets into a free-for-all that didn't really work for anybody except for a few groups who got rich. I won't mention the city of Los Angeles. Um, but that led to remarkably quickly, five years after a, um, a utility crisis that essentially bankrupted or nearly bankrupted the two big utilities in the state, California very quickly passed a climate law, which has an interesting tortured history, um, a very good tortured history that I won't go into in detail, but will come up in a number of uh, partial ways, called Assembly Bill 32. It was written by Fran Pavley, a former elementary school teacher in Agora Hills, um, when she moved from the Assembly to the Senate. Um, uh, she then passed Senate Bill 32, which is the climate bill that starts in 2020 and goes to 2030. And that I will talk about a fair amount as we go today because the data requirements, the types of reporting, um, and the mix of state level, international, and local action is kind of going to be the focus of my comments today. Um, the la our lab has kind of been partnered to kind of a number of interesting efforts, one of which as an example is something called PACE. PACE financing means property assessed clean energy. And it's actually, in, uh, it's, it's, it's an embarrassingly simple idea. It basically says that um, municipalities uh, around the United States routinely lend money to property owners, private and businesses to do various things, to widen or maintain sidewalks, to do, um, to, to to do a new sewage, a whole variety of things on private land, but for the public good. And so the deep conversation that was about literally two people standing over a file cabinet in Berkeley City Hall was, why don't we do this for energy? And PACE financing then became very quickly from an idea just in Berkeley. It was called Berkeley First at the time, which is not a good title. If you want your idea to go to other states, turns out that will turn off basically everybody instantly. So it got renamed PACE, that was very wise. Um, but basically it's lending money to property owners to put energy efficiency in place and to solarize buildings. And it went from sort of no backing to very quickly 16 states backed it. It was then killed at the federal level by Secretary uh, of Treasury Geithner because homes were going underwater during the financial crisis and any added debt uh, for homeowners was seen as uh, poison. 
even though study after study came out around California and elsewhere, that if you were investing in energy efficiency and solar, you were generally a better credit risk than the average homeowner. That didn't do much five years later. Pace is now a big thing. It's, it's, kind of, it's now used in multiple states, in Australia, um, in, in Europe. So it's an interesting thing that I worked on. It got a wonderful rating from Scientific American, and then it got no rating in the federal government, and finally it came back. Um, and among more recent features, something which will come up very much in the data context, um, one thing we worked on specifically because one of the PUC commissioners, uh, Carla Peterman, um, asked us to figure out how do we now include the newest technology, energy storage, into the mix of opportunities for California. And that led us to come up with a mandate for storage, which I will describe in a little detail as we go. And it basically says that utilities are required to have a certain amount of storage on board, meaning on the grid. Um, and you'll, you'll see again in a little bit how that sort of comes into play um, in a variety of ways. <clears throat> so let me to highlight where we are on the practice side of decarbonization. Again, this will be remarkably quick. Um, it's not meant to be a full tour, so any experts in the room can nap for 33 seconds. Anyone else, hopefully this is useful. So California coming out of this series of two climate laws, Assembly Bill 32, that called for California to reduce its emissions by about 20% by 2020. Um, and for the, you know, for the experts in the room, I see a few on the side, what that actually meant was that by 2020, California had to get back to the total emission level that we were at in 1990. When the international process that generated the IPCC started, we were using 1990 as the baseline because we started these negotiations in 1993. So it seemed like a reasonable year. However, so little happened for so long. We had a series of events where um, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed to by everyone except for the United States and a few other big emitters. Um, some places like Canada passed it and then discovered Alberta, which that was emitting more than the rest of the country and had to back out. There was a whole variety of features. But essentially, um, we agreed within California with this law to go back to our 1990 emissions level that was about a 20% reduction from where we were in 2005. Um, and Europe still uses 1990 as the baseline. But even before uh, President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, the US had already said 1990 is too long ago. Translation, we've gone up a lot in emissions. And so the US has redefined its baseline year to 2005. And that's a very data savvy way to reduce your, uh, your exposure. Um, and it's a footnote that I'm hoping will be corrected in history, but it ends up being relevant to lots of the numbers that you'll hear about climate issues. So in terms of a data-centric look at what are, the what are the options for California, one of the big things that had not been part of California's agenda before that climate law, AB 32, was passed was to find out how far can we push homes to go green using things like that PACE financing and by giving different incentives for energy efficiency. And so it took California 10 years, 2007 to 2017, to pass what is going to prove to be much less scary today than 2007. And that is California now requires that any new home built after 2020 to be carbon or to be um, energy neutral. And I'm going to use carbon and electricity and energy pretty specifically. And I'll explain as we go, because what's happened in the last little bit is a professor's either dream or nightmare, because no two members of the legislature are using the same definitions for any of the useful uh, numbers. Um, so what California has finally gotten through is to say we can't build anything if it doesn't generate as much electricity as it consumes. And that's presumably through a combination of making the homes as efficient as possible, and in the simplest vision, solarizing the rooftops. And, and as of today, something like two thirds of all solar panels, maybe a little bit less, in the whole country are on roofs in California. So we're the big player in terms of that. Um, 
And California is at about 600. I mean, we might have an expert in the room who knows more. Uh, if Meredith or someone is here, she has the exact number. But something like 600,000 rooftops in California have solar on them. And our goal for 2020 is a million. And we are likely to get close. We may not get exactly there. But already, I hope this is highlighting a really interesting data story. A million rooftops with solar each of which wants to interact with the utility in a way that utilities 20 years ago absolutely wanted no part of. Most of them still want no part of, but are being pushed to interact with. Right? The idea is that if you have solar on the roof, you want to get out of what, why, what looks like a crazy idea. And that is that against all economic good sense, Electricity prices for most, for much of the world, um, have been and remain so that a kilowatt hour purchased at 4 p.m. generally when demand is highest because business is on and homes are turning on, and a kilowatt hour consumed at 4 a.m. when, except for the undergraduates in the room, we're all in theory asleep, have the same cost, right? So you can't imagine a crazier market setup except for the convenience of not having to worry about the time of day. Every place that has gone to be a leader in energy efficiency, or like California, and now thankfully many other states that actually worry about the supply and demand, now go to so-called time of use. And so who has solar on the rooftop of their home, cooperative or other thing? That's a lower, really? That's about the lowest percentage I've ever seen in a talk in California, except how many people in the room are students who don't control their roof? Or renters. renters. Okay, so now I feel much better. Okay, okay, we don't have to disown ourselves anymore. But the, the utilities in California are collecting, whether they want to or not, data on these 600 plus thousand rooftops where they're getting the generation data and the consumption data, and whether it's through a nest or other meter, they're tracking all of that information. And so there is a massive story right now of the amount of information we have about what are the most cost-effective interventions, more efficient lighting, or better water heaters, or incentives for certain types of behavior. That information is being generated and collected in massive amounts, and very few users, are, very few analysts are actually dealing with it. There is a nice core division at the, at the, at, uh, at the California Energy Commission. Um, there are some wonderful groups on this campus and others, but it's amazing how little we do with that. And I'll come back to that theme later on. So this is one of the examples of the outcome of California's law. And on Monday, two things happened that took us to where the talk really begins. And that is, on Monday, Governor Brown signed Senator Kevin DeLeon's bill, Senate Bill 100, calling for 100% clean electricity. And I'm using those two terms very precisely because this is where the uh, unit analysis, unfortunately, breaks down in the state. 100% clean electricity by 2045, which sounds like a long way off, except that energy infrastructure is so long lived that that timetable is, is quite appropriate. The bill, in its first attempt, said renewable electricity. Um, and precisely in California, renewable means solar, wind, biofuel, geothermal, ocean energy, and bioenergy if it is produced sustainably, for which sustainable is not a well-defined term. Um, what's that? Hydro. Hydro counts if it's small. So a 30 megawatt a small dam, large hydro, of which California has a fair amount, almost 10% of our power, does not count towards that goal, and nuclear does not count. California has the most restrictive definition of any significant uh, municipality in the world, and this ends up being a very critical point. So New York State, for a while, was saying they were cleaner than California because they had a higher requirement called a utility level requirement or a renewable portfolio standard, but New, but New York State counts not only nuclear, but also huge amounts of hydro coming from Quebec. Now, that doesn't mean California doesn't use nuclear. There are nuclear power plants in the Southwest that we're happy to have nuclear used in other people's jurisdictions where we do nuclear by wire, 
and they deal with the other part of the story. So this is not a entirely logically consistent definition, but it's the one that went through the California process. And in fact, it was under Governor Brown's first time as governor that this, uh, that this came to pass. So 100% renewable, 100% clean electricity, which is meant to be wiggle words around hydro and nuclear, are permitted under this bill for 2045. Governor signed this. It, it had a bit of a tortured path, and it turns out there was much more drama uh, behind the scenes. Uh, two hours after signing this bill, the, for which he was not, uh, you know, he was Senator De 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 was the author, he, the governor, issued an executive order. Executive orders have no force of weight, except for in California, they sometimes come to pass. And the governor's executive order gets us into really complicated territory. It said for the same year, 2045, California must be carbon neutral. So I teach this course, in fact, I just came from an energy and society where we worry about things like energy is measured in joules, kilowatt hours, I mean, so all of these kind of important units that are kind of fundamental to understanding. This says carbon neutral by 2045 or before, and it goes on to say when California achieves carbon neutrality, then the state, fifth largest economy, must go carbon negative, meaning we have to be absorbing more carbon than we're emitting from our remaining facilities. So we have dueling bills. I should kind of have one of those things that make you sick to go flash back and forth here to here, here to here. Um, but this is getting us really deeply into the nerdy weeds of the process. Hence, let me try to simplify and then go on. And that is, globally, emissions have been rising. And California has adopted a strategy to get to 100% clean electricity or carbon neutral, depending on what you, what you want to think about it. And while we already view this thing about this process of decarbonizing the planet as massively difficult, um, we have a second worry, which has now been very, made very clear by hopefully pictures like this. This is actually authored by Christina Figueres. Um, the brother of the former president of Costa Rica, the first person to adopt a carb, uh, to pass a carbon price while in office, although his presidency did not go well. Um, but Christina is head of that climate process that led to the Paris um, Climate Accord, and she was a big player in the, in the, in the, in the, in the efforts last, this past week. Essentially, what this is, of course, showing you, we have a path of emissions, more or less linearly rising, uh, as a, on the global level, and every bit of delay of course, means that our peak gets higher. But more concerning to me, the rate of decarbonization, if you wanted to really get rid of carbon in this pre-2050 period, which is the, um, the global scientific consensus, means that this line gets steeper and steeper. And the concern is that this line here is, a three per, is on average a 3% slope. California and China, the two places that in different periods of time have decarbonized their economies the most, have never exceeded 3% for more than about three or four years. Sometimes 1%, sometimes 5 but 3% is the peak. And obviously, if we don't get this going quickly, we start, this is 4%, and then 5.5%, we start to get to levels that would need to be sustained for decades that we've never been able to sustain for even three or four years. And so I would argue that in the long run, it's really the slope of this line that's the bigger concern uh, over time. So now let me kind of move into the data-centric version of this. And I will do the first part fairly quickly, and then the second part with a little more time. And is it really 4.50 already? No. 4.57. Okay, my clock, my on, my on, good, right? <laughs> Good, OK. Um, so in thinking about this process around the world, one of the things that our lab did was to build a large linear program that is used to simply think through where are you at the level of a city, a region, a, a country, um, in terms of your on-the-ground assets for your energy system. Where are the power plants? How big they are? What type they are? Where are the transmission lines? What are the policies in place to encourage energy efficiency, to shift demand around, so-called demand-side management, where uh, you could r run your laundry at 4 p.m. when the demand is high, or 4 a.m. And if your machine was smart, 
you presumably could do it, although my daughter seems to be doing laundry at 4 a.m. all the time. Anyway. Um, but in theory, your machines could do a lot of that kind of shifting for you with minimal cost and maybe a big economic benefit. California, no surprise. Denmark, a few others, are huge leaders in demand-side management to bring down the peak demand at times when power is a short supply. There are lots of technology choices, and so this model switch um, that I never would have built if I'd actually taken enough courses in power systems and electrical engineering when I was a student, because I only after I started did I realize what a pain it was um, to put it all together, is essentially a model where we just minimize the net present value of a series of assets. The cost of projects, and so projects generally have a capital cost and then an annual cost, so a capital cost and a variable cost, and then there's a fraction of the time that they're on. A solar panel is not likely to be productive more than half the day because we have this thing called nighttime. Um, and some plants, like a hydro plant, could run more of the year. Um, and then we basically just take the total cost to operate the system. We require that the total capacity is larger than the peak demand plus a bit of a reserve margin. California uses a very large margin. Some other places use a smaller margin. Um, and then we look at how much power we have to spill or waste or put into batteries or electric vehicles. Um, and we make sure that our total generating supply is enough to meet our overall demand. So kind of a straightforward linear program, but at the scale of big economies, this is a huge amount of data. And we typically do this sub-hourly. So we run scenarios out to 2030, 2040, or 2050. Syn 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 synthesizing demand when we don't have it and matching that with supply, building new power plants, new transmission lines um, to meet demand. And to, and to this point in time, um, we have now done this for California and for all of the Western energy market, which is in green here, it includes what north uh, all the U US states west of Utah, little bits of Mexico, and then we have some observers. Um, I don't know quite know what that means, even though I've asked them multiple times. We've done it for Nicaragua. We're finishing Mexico. Actually, one of the data fellows um, here, Sergio Castellanos, is leading that. We've done it for Chile. Um, for odd reasons, Kosovo and Albania and Southeast Europe. Um, our biggest effort, as you can imagine, is a large collaboration with those three universities and the national grid operator in China. Um, Bangladesh has been finished. We built the model for India, but didn't release it because we got the data at a moment of weakness um, during the Indian blackouts, and they then wouldn't let us release the data afterwards. Um, Kenya, and we're finishing up Uganda now. And so we've built this, and we use it to interact with both um, academics and policymakers and the private sector and thinking about how to meet various targets. A story I will not explore, but just to give you a flavor for the amount of data, this is in one slide the evolution of the global solar energy industry. This is the efficiency of solar panels over time for different types of panels. The oldest, most traditional, the big blue crystalline ones are on here, thin film, the kind of thin things you roll out, new experimental organic cells, quantum dots, a whole variety of technologies are all on here. But these data points are the highest efficiency of that type of cell. And so this is a huge amount of data. When I first moved out of physics, I studied a particular type of thin film, a very low cost and low efficiency cell. But this is just a big fat data set. And when I began this uh, sort of this career choice uh, 30 years ago, solar was seen as too expensive. Now solar is very cheap. And the new player in the world is batteries. And so this is the exact same picture of the cost declines of a whole variety of types of batteries. Some like the ones in your car, lead acid batteries, lithium ion in your phone, some brand new things. There's something called a flow battery, which unlike the few thousand cycles in your phone, has millions of cycles. And then things like pumping water up a hill. That's this little green data set here. And I just got a call last week from a company that said, why would you pump water uphill in California? I said, well, because we, we have to take it over the mountains anyway. And they said, but aren't you sure on water? And I said, yes. So why don't you pump rock uphill? So this is a company that has proposed and has been given a contract to build railroad tracks and to take rocks up a mountain when power is cheap and bring them back down generating energy when power is inexpensive. And so 
it's entirely logical. It's something that you wouldn't have thought of. It's not high tech, but it's a player in the world of, of dispatchable resources. I put these two curves up because you can both see there's kind of a lot of information in them about these different technologies, but also because these are the data sets that we use to forecast where the prices might be over time. And of course, prices over time is one thing, but then how much we invest in research is a second question. And one of the areas where I'm actually trolling for interested students and colleagues who don't come from the energy world because we think more and more homogeneously about what we do with our energy data. This is the all of national um, in investment in research. Energy is just this kind of green thing here. That was the Jimmy Carter spike in interest, and we're now back down to a real dollar investment level back from the late 60s. Just so you know, the uh, um, at, one, at one low point under Clinton, um, it was estimated that more money went into dog food and pet food research than in energy research. We've thankfully bumped above that now, but that was a kind of a low point. Um, and our history of investing in all kinds of different technologies generates a data set on patents and papers and PhDs generated and a whole bunch of things that allow us to think, how much did we invest in making solar panels cheaper and making better batteries, energy efficiency. And this is a hugely unmined area, um, largely because almost everyone who has studied this has just looked at price of technology over time. That's essentially the curves I showed you here. What they haven't looked at is what are the other inputs that generate um, new products. And so one of the few places in the world that I've actually seen people dig into the data and look what might be some of the other drivers of innovation? This is the Japanese national program that in the 70s and 80s was the biggest global driver of bringing down the price of solar panels. And I've never seen a graph like this before or since. And what happened in this case was the Japanese national agency, this was actually done by Miti originally, um, and they said, well, if you want to make solar panels cheap, we need to invest in research and then we need to invest in getting them into the market. And so all of the green above the zero line is research and development investment. You can see it started off as just uh, 10 billion yen, and it started off, and then it ramped up, and then it came down some, um, and they waited, and then they started investing in deployment, giving incentives to homeowners and utilities like the programs I mentioned before, like PACE. And so they staged it, so they did R&D first, and then they invested on the deployment side and they put more into deployment here. This is a remarkably well thought out program. And so um, we have started to mine data on how effective investments in research have been. And my current favorite metric is not actually PhDs generated or patents. It's actually tracking individuals who started a PhD and then dropped out on the argument that many of those people who stayed in the field actually went into the commercial side. And so we have a team, actually a grad student in the Goldman School, Kenji Shiriashi, has been tracking individuals who started out funded by this program, but then moved into the private sector side. And that was a guess. And so one of the things I'm interested in is to get dramatically different guesses of what you think might be drivers of innovation and to go back into the data to try to figure out, can we not just do some simple co uh, correlation, but can we actually find some ways to make this more causal? And so we, we will see, who knows. So we use this model today to think through in all of those regions, which mixes of technology, which investments may be the cheapest way to go from where we are today to low carbon approaches. And so again, my largest team is working on China, um, the team that we're using um, to analyze California and the Western states. I just put up a graph of that just to kind of give you a flavor for it. Uh, but what you see here is the energy mix we are today, and I'll describe the colors in a second, but going from 2020, 30, 40, 50, at this point in time, to follow California's rule, we need to be zero carbon electricity, and we need to meet what the demand would be. And so these lines grow in magnitude because our demand for power is expected to be higher, and hopefully the colors are intuitive or close to it. Light blue is wind, um, 
Orange is solar thermal, not photoelectric, doing, um, doing heat-based. Yellow is solar. Purple, and there's not a lot of it on here, is, um, is nuclear. Um, gray is natural gas. And you can see we have a bunch of coal, which is brown. Some hydro here in dark blue. Um, we start to have more gas in the coming years. And we uh, have zeroed out most of the coal and the um, and actually, nuclear doesn't really make an appearance for some economic reasons. But in this final thing, you see lots of wind, lots of solar in its flavors of photo, uh, pho photovoltaic and solar thermal. Here is one scenario, and these are all different scenarios, um, from a reference one, just looking at price curves, to ones where we say, well, let's, let's get solar really cheap, or let's use lots of nuclear and carbon capture and storage. Let's worry about what Mr. Trump is trying to undo, and that is the fact that natural gas systems leak. And there are some places where natural gas leaks so much that on a carbon basis, coal is better than natural gas. Not in terms of water and other things, but in terms of carbon, you can find places, I won't mention them, North Dakota and Texas, um, where energy generated from gas would actually be a dirtier greenhouse ga uh, gas option than the coal systems. These are all just scenarios that either we've, uh, we've generated because we wanted to, or different, um, the governor or others asked us to run in thinking about how to make this uh, progression. My own favorites, no surprise, happen to be the ones over here that emphasize massive amounts of solar. Here's a case where solar is cheap and batteries are cheap, and you can see solar which is now only about 4% of California, um, becomes the dominant piece. 30 years ago, that would be seen as completely um, unrealistic. When I took electromagnetism in grad school from a Nobel laureate, he said, if solar is more than 2%, forget it, the grid will blow up, go communist. I don't know what, what it was going to do. But we examine these in the context of the countries and, and, and locations I mentioned. And again, California's progression. We were to be 20% clean by 2010. We missed it by a couple years. Our 2020 goal, um, I see David Woolley here who's worked quite a bit on this. Our 2020 goal is to be 33%. Um, we will probably be more like 37 or 38% um, renewable, not including large hydro, not including a nuclear by 2020. Our 2030 goal before last Monday was 50%, now it's 60%, and of course our goal for 2045 is 100%. Um, and I won't get into the details of mapping the transmission flows and the cost of different kinds of lines. It is a data orgy, I think is the only way to put it, largely because certain utilities have refused to share the data. Um, we then work closely with the Federal Energy Commission, which has forced them to give us the data under Freedom of Information Act. Um, and one of the tricks, and, and Henry Brady and others may have encountered this, what I found was that if for the utilities that, that refused to give us the data, but the federal government required them to give us the data, they took digital data, converted it back to PDF, blurred the data, and then gave us those files, and we had to apply a second round. And so it's been an interesting process to acquire the data that was originally digital. Um, and I mean, the details are not important here, but the colors are, are the same. Here is geothermal in, um, yeah, uh, sorry, solar thermal is in red, yellow is solar. Um, we have wind power here. And this is just the same kind of progression. And these lines are stylized representation of the transmission lines that we would need to build to get there. One of the interesting things that comes out of this kind of analysis is you discover immediately, you don't even need a model to get there, is that it's no surprise that we built our transmission network not thinking about 2050, of course. We, thought we, we built it thinking about the plants of the time, so largely using large hydro um, coal and some nuclear, but the solar and the wind resources, the middle of the United States is the best wind resource on land in the world, if we exclude Antarctica. The second best source is Western China. Um, and of course, we have great solar here. And so the network of new transmission we would need if we think about utilities of the future, looking like utilities of today, but using clean energy, is a build out of large high voltage lines to bring power long distances. This is exactly what China is doing. However, the United States has a second level debate that has not come to many places yet. And it's what I'm going to 
uh, conclude the talk on, and that is that this is a worldview where utilities of the future are basically like utilities of today. They generate large amounts of energy. It just happens to be clean, as opposed to being dirty, to meet the growing energy demand. And then there is, and I used to be able to say easily the Elon Musk view, but because of his current oscillatory personality, now I just say the distributed view is that why do we actually need to do this big network? And so now there's a huge bifurcation in thinking, and no one can argue definitively that one view or the other will win yet. So we're at a point of need to make massive investments, and one view is centralized systems, large power plants. The other one is Every rooftop, residential, or commercial has solar. Some homes have energy storage in the basement, whether that's a flywheel underground, or whether that's a lithium ion or other battery on the wall, or whether that's your electric vehicle, whose battery holds enough energy to power three or four homes for upwards of a day, depending which size power pack you get. That totally distributed worldview looked improbable three decades ago, or looked impossible three decades ago, looked improbable two decades ago, one dec decade ago looked very expensive, and today you can find perfectly sane, highly kind of informed analysts who have totally divergent views on where we go in that kind of picture. So we are seeing a really interesting, complicated world. One of the first Examples is that using this switch model, we developed a requirement for a certain amount of storage. It was passed by the Public Utilities Commission. So one of the first projects was Southern California Edison now has these batteries with millions of cycles. It's a liquid battery called a flow battery powered by solar. Um, and they are going to be storing enough energy to meet the state's requirement that each utility basically has to be able to meet 2% of peak hottest day summer demand with stored energy. It's a kind of a new world to think about things. A huge data question that has emerged is how are we doing in terms of using all of this new technology to not just generate clean energy, but also to be a tool for a more equitable, or as Valerie said in the beginning, a just transition. And one of the really frightening stories shouldn't surprise anybody, is that you need to generally have a roof to put solar on it, kind of a definition. And generally, you're not going to invest on solar if you don't own your roof. And so when we look around the country, what we're seeing over and over again is that the most affluent households benefit the most from the subsidies or the policies that enable not only solar on the rooftop, but also electric vehicles in the garages, a whole variety of things. And so we are seeing right now I would argue a point, I hope, of peak inequality in the sense that our clean energy policies are about as strongly biased to benefit the rich as you could possibly imagine. Now there's a, I don't want to say good, but there's a plausible argument why that's the case. And it's largely be before these technologies got cheap, the only place where they could be deployed was in the more affluent businesses and homes. Um, but now that at least in California and a few other places, we're seeing a large scale distribution. In fact, solar is in many places one of the cheapest options, all that data um, flowing into to demonstrate that. Now we're seeing the folly of that push towards the lowest cost. Not folly at the time, but if you really want to bring people along in this transition, making solar and then electric vehicles and then being able to sell power back from battery in your basement. I already know several homeowners who are building their home to accommodate a battery that will be their ability to arbitrage the system, to buy cheap power at night, or we thought at night, now it turns out cheap power will be in the afternoon because there's so much solar, and then sell it back when the demand is high. So we are at a point of very high uncertainty as to which routes, but certainly in terms of thinking about something where you can get the population largely on board and thinking about this transition, topics like this um, are central to a lot of uh, my lab works on right now, and it's again, those data sets just tell a horrific story. If you look at low income, Latino and black neighborhoods in California, even when we control for income, they have one-sixth the amount of solar installed per capita as do low-income Asian and white households. And there's some interesting reasons about where companies went, et cetera. But 
that is just a remarkably um, inequitable mix. So I'm not going to do the same story for China. It's very similar to what I showed before. China has an ability to invest much more centrally than we do, which is sort of the overall story. And China has just a fabulous wind resource, second only to ours out here. And of course, the population is largely clustered here. So China, unlike us, is already pushing ahead, building high voltage line after high voltage line, because China is committed to some very high and aggressive decarbonization goals. They actually agreed to them with President Obama in 2014. And while we have gone into whatever uh, complicated world the US is in, China has stayed the course. And China has now announced things like they are going to ban the production domestically of combustion vehicles. And China is the world's largest vehicle um, producer. And to have a strategy to get all combustion vehicles off the road, presumably in a longer time scale. We're talking in the 2030s and 2040s, but kind of a remarkable shift in the overall, uh, in the overall mix of energy. And so again, we use these models and these kind of um, large scale objectives. We've been working closely to set what might be that time. And we're looking at kind of a 2030 to 2035 period where China, we think, will be able to carry out this banning of domestic production of internal combustion vehicles, and then perhaps a decade or more later, getting them off the road. And of course, getting the tail of those curves off the road is high. And this is novel, but it's not the only one. Um, France and Ireland and Volvo as a company have already committed to this zero combustion vehicle uh, first production and then and usage pathway. So interesting mix at the large scale. I'm now going to jump to the other end of the spectrum. And I want to highlight for the last few minutes a, a question of data and behavior. And it's one where we are really thinking that our hope is that a much broader set of thinking about how do we work at the behavioral end of the spectrum. Um, and so this is generally a field called ecological or carbon footprinting. My laboratory runs one of the state-sponsored models to basically look up how much energy is required to do various things, to get you to work, to grow the tomatoes or the tofu or, or whatever, to get it to you, et cetera. And so the calculator that we've built um, initially with support from Governor Schwarzenegger um, is called Cool California. Um, there's a website which is maintained publicly by a set of NGOs. There's a research website I'll show you in a second. And we use this to, to provide a tool so that you can look at your carbon footprint and also look at what are the opportunities to reduce it. Uh, we have uh, Paul Chapman here, the former head of Head Roy School. They use this to do assessment classroom by classroom and to think about what the options are. And at its highest peak level, generally when the state has issued a new mandate, um, we've had up to 100,000 hits a day, which our data server couldn't handle, um, of people using the, the maps that we generate. There's downloadable versions for your cell phones from this website where you go to the maps page and you can then have it. You go and change zip codes or change utility areas. It'll tell you what your electricity mix is where you are depending on what kind of transportation you do, et cetera. And so we've used this tool to do everything from all UC campuses took part in a cross um, UC carbon challenge. Berkeley sadly came out fourth of that. I, was, I thought we'd do a little better than that. Um, uh, Davis and Santa Cruz won. I think Irvine was in second place. They tied, and we were uh, down the list a little bit. But we've used this both in California and nationally to look at the carbon footprint of electricity generation, um, to look at the carbon emissions from natural gas, um, from transportation, from the goods and services we buy, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of kilowatt hours a year by zip code, here's kind of one of these national maps. Um, natural gas um, in terms of cubic feet per year. Um, for the goods we buy, for the services we consume, um, for food, and this is the only one that I've cheated a little, well not cheated, I've used a different definition. For these, I've, I've used the end use. So a home or a business, this is the footprint, um, and I've just averaged across the zip code. But for food, I've actually used where it's produced. And so this one is a different metric because it's harder to trace it. And so areas where we do huge amount of irrigation, the big crop circles, large amounts of pesticides, 
Um, we see a carbon footprint much higher than other areas. So a stalk of corn grown here in a big irrigated crop circle, very different than rain-fed corn grown in northern Minnesota, as an example. Um, and we sum all that up to look at carbon emissions by zip code. And of course, if you get this data and you go on the website, what's the first thing everyone does? They go look up themselves, right? So the first use of this for every person who logs on, we get to track how they use it, is they look at the, um, the average for their zip code, they do it for their home, and they, and they do the comparison. Um, and that's been a pretty interesting start because the more data we put online, the more we've seen people starting to compare themselves to their neighbor, their grandmother or grandfather, uh, homes of similar size. And so there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. So one interesting feature, and New York is a, is a wonderful example. New York City wins environment award after environment award for having lowest carbon footprint, this and that. And of course, New York, like San Francisco and every other city, conveniently defines the suburbs as someone else's problem. Right? So of course, the, the economic unit is not lower Manhattan. I hate to break that to any Manhattanites in the room. Um, but we observe almost every city that's kind of been a leader in this process has conveniently decided to define the wider economic unit of someone else's problem. And Berkeley is, no exempt, is no, not exempt. So when Berkeley won a huge Department of Energy award for being a low carbon, a solar city, we did so by defining I-80 as someone else's problem. Right? And you can argue most of the cars are passing through. It's not really quite fair, because that means that the city that goes first gets to define the problems for somebody else. Um, and the places that come later, or someone's going to have to finally say they, they deal with the problem. But we've been doing more and more high resolution maps. You can get in you know, Piedmont higher income, larger homes, more hot tubs, more marijuana growing in the basement. I mean, who knows what they're using it for. Um, lower income areas, smaller homes, generally lower. Places that live directly on transit corridors are lower still. Long commuting distances. And one of the interesting aspects of this process has been now to think through, and this is where I'll conclude, where are we in terms of where our emissions are today versus where they might need to be down the road if we want to meet these targets. And so if you go onto the website, we break it out by exactly the categories I mentioned. Um, our transportation, our electricity, um, things we consume that are durables and not. The amount of recycling gets a bit of a kickback. And thinking about where we would need to be in 2030, 2040, 2050 relative to today is what these carbon footprint tools have been most useful for. And so. As of this point in time, California's got a couple decades to try to make this transition happen. You probably wasn't surprised you were using a lot of this information to look at what are the most cost effective ways to reduce your carbon footprint today based on a current energy mix, putting solar on your roof or not, deciding to walk to farmer's market or other, other means. But then the overall question is, what mixture of these state level policies using big models like switch and what mixture of these local things you control yourself are we going to need to pull on as levers to decarbonize the rough story today is that we think we can probably beat down our emissions assigned to each of us by about half using these state or regional level things, cleaner electricity, better transit, and about half of it is still left up to actions which today are largely voluntary or incentivized. But if we're really serious about these targets, both gathering, utilizing, and sharing this data, and finding out what are the pathways that are hopefully not just lowest carbon, but also most equitable is where we're going to need to go. And that's really where these two bills, Senate Bill 100, and then this executive order likely set up California for the next 10 years of work. So thank you very much. I know I've gone a little bit over. I'll stop there. Great, OK. And so.